I'm saying hello today on October 18th, 2010 from a very, very special place in New York City, the Lower East Side Tenement Museum, a place that I've been wa uh, wanting to visit for a long time. And right here in front of me is Daryl Hamilton. Hi, Daryl. Hi. Nice to meet you. You've nice just you. guided us on a wonderful hour-long or even longer tour of one of the upstairs apartments. Please tell us a little bit about the Tenement, me tenement Museum. Sure. What is it? How did it come into being? Sure. What's its goal? Sure. Well, this came into being in 1988. Our founder, Ruth Abram, in 1988 actually purchased this building for around three quarters of a million dollars approximately, which was a steal back then. This is right on the cusp of gentrification of this neighborhood. And the reason why she, she this is something, this is a dream of hers, to purchase at the time it was um, about 85% abandoned, not 100% abandoned. There were stores on the first floor in the basement. But it was a dream of hers to purchase an abandoned tenement and to try to create a space to honor the many, many, many people who lived in this neighborhood. Um, there's a, there are many books that have been written on, about just the numbers of people who would have lived here. Um, there's a book that I find very interesting that was published last year. Vincent Canato wrote a book about Ellis Island entitled American Passage, and he estimates that 40 percent of Americans can trace, can trace at least one ancestor back to Ellis Island. Mm -hmm. And virtually anyone who came through Ellis Island spent some time in this neighborhood because this is where you were brought to. Exactly. Very interesting because the Lower East Side is sort of the original catchment basin for all the, the fresh immigrants, right? What a great way of putting it. Yeah. When, when did that all start and who was coming here? Who were the ethnic groups that came here at what times? Great question. Well, I, I will put this in the context of certainly the Tenement Museum and, and the period of time that we cover. Mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, this building was built in 1863. And when this building was built, this was a very German neighborhood. It was known as Klein Deutschland. And it would have been a very German roughly from the mid-1850s right up until 1890. And then from 1890 until the mid-1920s, this was the Eastern European Jewish Lower East Side. And then from the mid-1920s right through the 30s, this was heavily Southern Italian, slash melting pot, I would mm -hmm. say. And mm -hmm. it has remained melting pot ever since. Very interesting. Now, I went on the tour of the Moore family apartment, is that right? That's correct. What, can you just briefly summarize what we saw on that tour from the sure. empty apartments to the Moore family's apartment and the backyard? Okay, yes. So on this tour, well, we started with the backyard because the backyard is really essential in terms of sort of setting the table uh, to give people a sense of, of the kinds of conditions people were living under. So um, we were in the backyard. Uh, there's an outhouse in the backyard that's been back there for about five and a half months. It's not a working outhouse, but people living here, uh, when the Moors would have been living here in the middle of the 19th century, would have been living with outdoor toilets and water being outside. So we talked a great deal about that and about the unsanitary conditions. But again, these conditions would not have been viewed as being sanitary or unsanitary then. They're, they're we're just normal. The conditions. Exactly. They're normal. Yeah. We, we don't know what we don't know. Uh, and so, so from that point, uh, from leaving the backyard, we, we headed inside the building to the fourth floor of the building. Uh, everyone got to see what an unrestored tenement apartment looks like because we leave at least one apartment unrestored on each floor where we do tours because it's so important, I think, for people to see the before mm -hmm. and not just the after because people get a better sense of what restoration really means. Right. So we, we spend a little bit of time there, actually spent some time in an unrestored apartment with a music group mm -hmm. so that everyone would get a chance to hear the type of music that would have been very popular with Irish immigrants uh, living in New York City in the middle of the 19th century. And from there we went on to the Moore family apartment where we talked a great deal about the kinds of struggles this family would have had because they're living here when this is not an Irish neighborhood, when it's a very German neighborhood. And some of the struggles connected to that, some of the struggles with just being an Irish immigrant. And and a lot a lot of what that what that really implied, and given the fact that the Irish were very much looked down upon and were considered the lowest of the low. And uh, really the way that and the way in which this family despite all of the struggles, the way they continue to fight on, the fact that they're even living in a tenement is a huge, huge, huge thing, because most Irish would not have been living in tenements. So we got a chance to talk a lot about that, what, what this family went through, 
the, the loss of children because of unsanitary living conditions, uh, the mother dying, many things. Talking about that, uh, what impressed me the most was we, we saw these four outdoor latrines basically oh, and yes. how many people living in the building and sharing them? Well, uh, we would have had probably close to 100 to 125, uh, um, to 100, 100 to 125 people mm -hmm. living in the building at the time and there were only, as you mentioned, only four latrines mm -hmm. and there was also a German beer hall in the basement. Yeah. So we need to factor the patrons of that German beer hall too so that would probably okay. bring the number up to close to 200 people using four to six latrines. And one of the other social problems of the time uh, of the times you were talking about yes. was swill milk and that's yes. something I wasn't familiar with. And most people aren't familiar yeah. with. And it was a terrible public health problem mm -hmm. because uh, you know the, the fact that and this is something that I brought up too over the course of the tour you've got a very unique situation going on in New York City in the middle of the 19th century because you have two mass immigrations happening almost simultaneously a German immigration and an Irish and much of that new population is being represented by children and ch small children babies and of course they need milk and uh, you know the farms here are having a, a really tough time providing enough milk for all of these new people who are coming in and but you have some people who are some unsavory types who are farmers who are trying to cut corners to try to make as much money as they can make from milk and they really don't care about the quality of the milk so what they're what they're doing the reason why it's called swill milk because this is tainted milk what they're what they're actually doing is they're feeding their cows some very bad stuff uh, hops from the distillery waste all kinds of things it's making cows sick they're producing a milk that is terrible milk uh, and once it's transported here because of no refrigeration, it's in horrible condition. It's really in bad shape. Pushcar peddlers are selling the milk. They're adding chalk to the milk. They're adding ammonia to the milk. All kinds of things. And it, obviously it results in terrible things happening to children who are, who are ingesting this milk. Exactly. And, and obviously refuse being thrown into the backyard Absolutely. where women were doing laundry yes. and children were playing. And right. Uh, unbelievable conditions that you you know you can't even relate to today anymore. Oh no, I don't think any of us can. <laughs> what what are the reactions that people have when they come here to this museum? Mm, very similar to the reactions I think you saw with this group. Mm -hmm. I think people often come feeling that they know a lot about what conditions were like, and I think they they end up leaving oftentimes saying to themselves, "Wow, there are a lot of things I thought I knew mm -hmm. that." weren't really quite all there and the conditions were far more complicated not necessarily worse but more complicated than I might uh, than I was sort of perce perceiving them to be that it's it's a very that you've got lots of people living on top of each other and and very very unsanitary living conditions and that produces a lot of behavior that people don't necessarily consider. I mean, I don't think that's really in, the, in, in their heads. And I don't think it's hard for us to wrap our minds around all the specific kinds of things that people would have done on a daily basis when, you, when you're living with very unsanitary conditions, but don't, don't view them that way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, bringing up slop sinks, which is something that I brought up. Yes. I can tell people in the group were very surprised by that. Yeah. And asking, where would the water go after you used it? Well, it would trickle into a bucket underneath and you'd dump it out the window mm -hmm. along with all the other waste. I could see reactions to that like wow God. it's almost medieval yeah, when you think about it it really is yeah yeah so all those kinds of things people react in, in a very interesting way and mm -hmm. people usually will tell me at the end of a tour that you know that this really came to life for them it must be fascinating for school children that come oh, in here from yes. houses with three or four bathrooms Absolutely. and jacuzzi tubs oh, and yeah. you know uh, I, I mean these are you know everybody's forefathers that lived like this 150 mm -hmm. years ago and mm -hmm. we have come so far, you know. Oh, haven't we though? Yeah. Over, if you think about it, a relatively short period of time. Exactly. We really have. Exactly. Now there's a lot more information that people, I would imagine, can get online about your museum. They can, at tenement.org. Tenement.org. So very, very, very easy website. Yeah, Perfect. Yes. Daryl, you've done a phenomenal, a phenomenal job. I really enjoyed the tour. Oh, thank, thank you, you so much, and I'll come back for more tours, because you do you offer are. more than oh, one, yes. right? We offer every floor, with the exception of the top floor, is a separate tour. A separate tour. Sure. Yes. Oh, and you're building, what I wanted you to mention is another yes. new building? Yes. So there's an old building that's on uh -huh. the corner here, on the corner of Orchard and Delancey. Mm -hmm. And we purchased the building recently. And what we're doing right now is we're gutting it and we're doing all kinds of uh, reconstruction of the building. And we're going to be doing restoration of that building too. 
One great reason why we're so happy to have a, a second building is one of the frustrations we had about this building is that no one has lived in this building since 1935, mm -hmm. so we've never been able to tell the stories of immigrants who came to this neighborhood after 1935. Mm -hmm. Now that we've purchased this building on the corner, we can do that. That's great. When is it going to be finished, roughly? Probably in about a year. About a year. In about a year. So definitely a reason to come back here. Oh, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Daryl. Thank you. Thank you so much.